Welcome to Aftertaste 2015. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this ninth year of Aftertaste. As designers, and especially interior designers, we design experiences which include dialogue, which is kind of the subject of tonight. And so in, to improve that dialogue a little, we're going to just ask you to move down, forward, if you can, if you don't mind. So we'll populate these, the first rows, if we can. Thanks. Tonight, we're going to explore experience. Thank you, Matthias Kunzli, for setting down our first beats. My name is John Sara Ruth, and I'm the founding director of the MFA Interior Design Program here at Parsons. And I've been the chair of Aftertaste since 2009. Imagining this year's symposium has been totally fascinating and fun. Together with recent graduates, Catherine Murphy and Elizabeth Parker, Professor David Lewis, and with the support from our school dean, Brian McGrath, Associate Dean Robert Kirkbride, we've thought to bring to light the question of imagination and its role in the design process. Early on, we realized that given the topic of imagination, which can be both totally surprising and totally elusive, we have to question and perhaps deviate from the convention of this academic forum, the symposium. In ancient Greece, the symposium was a convivial discussion held after a drinking party. The word symposium from Sympinian is to drink together. There was known to be food and drink, entertainment was provided, and poetry and music were central. Perfect for interrogating the imagination, we thought. Actually, we, maybe we should have had wine here first. But as we conceived of this aftertaste symposium, we realized that if we really wanted to look inside imagination, that we need not just talk about it, we also have to demonstrate it and attempt to ignite it in everyone in the room. So we're going to try. This is a tall task. We're going to try. Tonight and over the next 24 hours, we're going to get inside some incredibly imaginative minds. And tonight, an opening night, instead of hosting a keynote speech, as has been the tradition, we're hosting a demonstration led by Michael Schober. But before we continue, I'd like to introduce our visionary leader at Parsons, Executive Joel Dean, Joel Towers, to welcome you all to Aftertaste. Thanks, Joel, for coming. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you know, I get to do a lot of really fun things as Dean of Parsons. Um, and, you know, we put on some pretty big shows. We do, you know, big fashion shows and we open buildings that we build in communities and we do a lot of really great stuff. But I have to tell you that this weekend, this event today and tomorrow and leading up to the aftertaste dinner um, uh, at the end of this is absolutely the most spectacular thing that we do. It's, a, it's such a great, it is the event of the year at Parsons. Um, I love this event. And it's because we get to do so many extraordinary things. Um, we transform our own spaces uh, here at the university. Um, we don't settle for a normal uh, event. We reinvent it, it seems to me, every year. Uh, and this is no exception. Um, what's exceptional about it, though, is I also get to introduce Michael Schober this year. Uh, and for me, that is a double pleasure, because it represents uh, not just the expansion of aftertaste to our colleagues across the university. We actually sort of had already been doing that in many ways throughout the year, but years. But this has been, um, this is in its most explicit form is bringing together the, um, the brilliance of our social science faculty with our design uh, faculty here and with our colleagues from um, the design world outside. And, uh, and Michael, in so many ways, has been the leader in this area uh, throughout his time. So I'm, I'll say a couple of things that I need to say formally about Michael to introduce him, because if you don't know him, it's important that you know who he is. But, um, it's really the personal side of introducing Michael that gives me the most pleasure um, because he is um, not only brilliant but a great friend. And he was my colleague, Dean, 
for six years, I believe, um, uh, here at the university. So Michael only recently stepped down as dean of New School for Social Research, um, which he led through both tumultuous and important times uh, here at the university, um, and led it toward the collaborations that we are able to do uh, now here with, with them at, from Parsons' side. So um, I could not have had a better partner in crime in that than Michael. Um, he is truly a dear friend of mine. He happens also to be a professor of psychology. Um, I'm not sure if that plays a role in it, but uh, uh, he, and he has a second role, which um, is associate uh, provost for research at the New School because he couldn't get enough of being somehow in the administration. Um, but he describes his own work on his personal blog, not on his web site here, but on his personal blogs, he says, I'm a psychologist who studies how people coordinate their actions, the mental processes underlying that coordination, and how new technologies mediate coordination. He then goes on to say, I'm also a classical pianist who specializes in chamber and co uh, collaborative music and in performances that explore how new technologies can enhance audience experience. And this coming together of these things that might at first not seem to be um, comprised of one individual is typical Michael. Bringing together performance, classical uh, music, psychology, he is um, an extraordinary thinker and a great friend and teaches with us at Parsons as well, so there's also that. Um, and tonight is a kind of experiment. In fact, I think in many ways it might be the most radical of the aftertaste experiments, we'll see. We've never been too afraid of trying things. And so, Michael, um, I think the stage is yours. Please welcome Michael Schober. So thank you so much, Joel. That's extremely kind and generous. And, uh, uh, and I really am honored to have been invited to help kick off this year's aftertaste symposium and get to participate in a conversation that is uh, uh, with thinkers and makers who come from so many different perspectives. I think that's really exciting and something we get to do at the New School uh, because of the unique confluence of what we have here that makes it a really exciting place to be. So the plan of the evening is, as Joel said, not a traditional talk. It is a series of what I'm gonna call explorations. These are not experiments in the scientific sense, uh, though what we're doing is informed by my training as an experimental psychologist, where what we do in my field is we set up situations and make changes in them and see what happens. And uh, is there some feedback going on? Yes. Um, so make some changes to see what happens. Uh, and, um, and, I, and we're going to do it in an unusual way by using improvised music as the medium of exploration. Okay, so um, we, uh, I will tell you along the way what we're going to do. The people who have agreed to participate don't know what is going to happen. So that is part of what makes this fun and interesting. And um, uh, I, as I said, I'm extremely excited about this. We are not coming to conclusive answers. The point of tonight is to explore experiences and to explore experiences among those who are performing as musicians and explore experiences among you as participants in this event. And the idea is to think about how this lets us open up our minds to imagining possibilities in interior space, okay? So that's the idea. And um, the, before we start, I would like to introduce you to, oh, that's me, sorry. Uh, so, um, my background actually is connected with the issues we're thinking here. I have published papers on topics related to these, but those are scientific papers in journals. And again, that is not the plan of the evening, okay? The plan is to be inspired by, for me, to be inspired by that thinking and think about an experience here that we will create together. Okay. Um, so, our three musical explorations. Um, I want to first introduce you to our uh, fantastic percussionist that you've been hearing as we move in. This is Matthias Künzli. He is a percussionist extraordinaire. And um, I hope, please welcome him. This is, he's been playing all along. Um, and Matthias has been extremely game to agree to participate without knowing what is going to happen. So, um, so let's get started. Nice. Okay. So, um, uh, 
For this first exploration, I'd like to ask Matthias to start improvising in whatever way he likes, okay? And along the way, a few things will change, okay? So, Matthias, um, please feel free to respond to any change that you notice as you see fit. Or, if you notice a change and do not feel any need to change anything, that's fine too. Anything you feel like doing is absolutely fine. Getting in trouble right now. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, okay. So, um, if we could um, get started. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, first, Matthias, if you could tell us a bit about, um, did you notice anything during the course of that? And if so, what was it? Just gonna make a little noise. 
Um, mostly light. Okay. And Actually, really only light. Different shades of yellow. Okay. At one point, it was really warm yellow that I think maybe maybe slow down. I believe. Um, the guy who came late. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, man. <laughs> Uh, that's really it. You walked around a little bit. I don't know if you wanted me to stop. I didn't really care. <laughs> so okay. I don't know if that was that. Uh, but that's, yeah, based mainly light, little shades of, 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 of... Okay, and as a performer, did you feel that that um, was affecting how you were performing, or were you doing what you were doing despite that? I let it affect me, yeah. I want it to be affected by something, I think. I probably was a little bored of myself, maybe. Okay. But I, I could have also ignored it. Uh, right. But I, I didn't... Ignore it, I don't think, yeah. Okay, so even though from our perspective you were looking really down in your instruments and it didn't look as if you were noticing light, you were sensing light? Is that there might have been much more going on than I didn't notice. Is that what's going on? <laughs> Probably all like, yeah, I didn't see anything. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess mainly down here, I don't know. Okay. Just, uh, yeah. Great, thank what, you. What now did I, I miss? No, 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 no. <laughs> so now I'd like to know from the audience perspective uh, for folks here, and we have some folks with mics who are ready to hand them over to anybody who raises their hand. Um, if, uh, could be, if anybody could say, what was the difference in experience during those phases from your perspective? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, for, for me, what um, what had an, an influence to me was actually what you said at the beginning. You said that Matthias, yeah, that Matthias would um, would pay attention to what he notices and would let that affect him. <laughs> so that um, made me experience it completely different because now I was kind of following what you were following. And that became for me a mix between something outer but also something inner that hmm. was happening in me. So I never really consciously framed a performance like that, that the performer would follow something that I would kind of follow. <laughs> Got it, good. So there was another one up there. Yeah. Um. So it was interesting, I guess, uh, when, I guess you weren't following this, but somebody came in at some point during your performance, and uh, to me, I was also watching to see what you were responding to. So I heard the rhythm in your drums change to mimic the steps of somebody walking up the stairs, and I don't know if that's actually what you were doing, but that was what I saw. Yeah, that was what I was doing. Okay. Yeah, just <laughs> pure imitation. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's the only thing besides the light changes that I noticed. So that was him. Yeah. Right. So um, the three phases of light were first that you were in a spotlight in sort of traditional stage lighting. It would be just you. Second phase is full stage lights up, which no longer differentiates you from the rest of the stage. And the third phase was full house lights up, which um, changes the relationship between spectators and spectated, right, in, um, in a particular way. And the question is whether and how that affects you as the performer, but also how it changes the experience for the audience, right? If lights are on you, how different is your experience than if lights are not on you? And if you think about the space we're in right now, it has a very clear delineation of this is stage, that's watchers, right? And, and everything about the space screams that in every way, from the flat here to the angle there to um, the colors, all of it every, is, is making that distinction very, very clear. Uh, but um, to me, it seems that the, the way I would frame the change as a cognitive psychologist would be to say we were changing focus. We we're changing audience focus through this lighting change. Nothing else about the space was changing but light. And in one case, the focus of attention is every, every signal from the lighting is telling you, look over there right now, that's what's happening. Once we 
change that focus to be the whole stage, we are no longer sending the signal that that's the place you're supposed to be looking, although of course you already were looking there because you'd started there. And once we bring the house lights up, that potentially opens the awareness that I'm in the light too, not just the performer. So that was for what we were trying to manipulate here, um, one, of the, one of the things we were trying to get at, the issue of focus and how spaces and what you do in the spaces changes focus. And um, from my perspective, the, um, when a spotlight is putting a focus like that, part of what, an, as an audience member, I am interpreting is that somebody intended me to look there, right? There's, it's like there's another agent in the room that even whether you're not conscious of it or not, there is the idea that, there, that somebody wanted me to look there which brings in this interesting question about who else is involved in the dialogue we're experiencing right now? To what extent are we aware that there are other agents who are directing us and, and focusing on and what we will attend to now? Any other reactions out there? Um, the, the, uh, the experimenter uh, entered this I, from my perspective, uh, very much so. Uh, and although the light changed, you had already uh, removed, I guess, the proscenium, what do you say? Proscenium, yeah. Proscenium, yeah. Um, and, and remained so, uh, and continued to remain so. Uh, yes. So it's, it's, I think of the, all these nature programs where you don't see the cameraman. <laughs> the cameraman's always there. Uh, but you were more obtrusive. Uh, in that sense, you became visible to me, um, and it, it ameliorated to some extent the light changes. I noticed them, but your presence continued and continues, and then it makes me think about what's going to happen in the next experiment. <laughs> you know, uh, it would be very different if you went, came out here and sat down, uh, in contrast to your remaining up there, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I agree completely, and, and we are setting up, I mean, this is not a controlled psychology experiment, first off, right, this is clearly, and we are not setting up a fully controlled environment, we are not um, measuring you, we're not looking at your heart rate or your galvanic skin response or asking you to fill out your self-report survey responses to what's happening right here, so this is quite informal. Um, really, it's, it's about thinking about how would you look at how people are reacting in the first place, right? And. Um, yeah. But that's what I'm saying, that it affected how I looked at it. Yes. Um, and, no, that's right. And, and I, it's true. I set it all up in a way that yeah. then makes you look in a very particular way. And if I hadn't set it up that way and that had just been a thing that was randomly happening, you may have had an extremely different experience of it, right? Which again, for me, raises that question about how do you interpret the attentions, intentions behind the changes that people make in a physical space? And to what extent do you interpret what's happening because you interpret that somebody intended it to mean, be meaningful. Okay. All right, there was another uh, comment. Hi. Uh, with the changes of light, I feel that in this dialogue, first it was a monologue where he was, we were all paying attention to him. And even though we were silent, the minute that we're all in the same level, it, it became a dialogue, even though we were silent. So I felt that with the change of light. So when it was a change of light to the stage or to the, to the audience? To the audience. To the I audience. just felt that you became like aware. We were talking right. to him somehow. So my perspective on dialogue is, is um, that's, it's a really interesting point. My, my perspective on dialogue is that um, anytime you have one person talking, whether it's in front of an audience or to one other, both parties are involved. Right? That, it's, uh, that it is almost impossible to do anything in a dialogue without paying attention to what your audience is giving back to you. Right? And that actually the audience molds what a speaker in a conversation or a musical performer does by the kinds of reactions they give if the speaker is able to pay attention to that along the way. So I, I, I think um, the interactivity of dialogue is, is extreme and far more than folks realize that very often a speaker is really monitoring the partner or the set of partners very, very, very closely, and that, that therefore the audience is as much a part of the act of the speaking as the speaker is, um, which is a very complicated way to think about it all. And, and again, the, 
this lighting manipulation does highlight and change attention, right? Focuses attention differently to highlight that different aspect of interaction. That's how I, I would think about it. Down here. Uh, we need a mic. I just, I just wanted to add that the biggest shift that I experienced was sound. Um, and I was trying to observe the cues that you had in your shifts, in your improvisational movement. And it's, you know, I, I hesitate to identify the causal <laughs> forces, but shape of space is one of them, and how it, it um, speaks back to you from the internal dialogue that you have with the sound. But the, the one observation just maybe is more of a metaphor, is how there can be a resonance, or like uh, someone's being swung on a, on a swing. And then at some point, it caps and it goes into something else, or like a flow out of a faucet. If it's a slight flow, there's one geometry to it, and then the flow increases, it goes into another, another movement. And then if it increases, it goes into another movement. And there, it just seemed like there were movements in your improvisation that may have been fed by the light and the, the guy walking and the shape of the space and who else knows what, but there's also an internal engine and propelling of your own work. Um, since I didn't know what was going to happen or what he was going to, you know, throw at me, I actually expected like bigger things or you know more extreme <laughs> things, you know. And when when don't worry, we're, we'll get there. No, that's all good. <laughs> and uh, sorry, latecomer, <laughs> but if when when latecomer, what's your name? Where's he at? Jorge. Jorge. When Jorge came in. Um, I thought was, that was part of it, you know. I was expecting another guy from the back, maybe from here. You know, there's a bunch of doors. I don't know, you know, I've only been here <laughs> once and I know there's two doors behind me. Or to the side, you know? So I thought that kind of was uh, gonna just be the start of, 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 a, of, of maybe a bigger impact rather than just that light. And it doesn't help, of course, me having my eyes half closed all the time when I play, <laughs> trying to get these light cues or, or, or you know. Uh, so I guess in a way, um, You know, he was saying he was he's mentioning mentioning dialogue. He felt it that way. I I almost feel sorry that I didn't. You know, in a way, like I'm don't really, but you know, in a way, like he says dialogue. I feel like I didn't really um, react or, or you know react to the to the light change when the audience came on, as 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 he felt or as you you all probably felt it because I was still thinking, okay, I'm the guy who has to do something up front, you know? So, you know what I mean? It was, it was, if I wasn't on stage, maybe not even behind my drums, it would be a different story than, than um, obviously it would be a different story than if I wasn't here, but you know, does that make any sense with, with the yeah. dialogue and, and me not really feeling like I, I re maybe I, I respected that as much as he maybe felt it was, you know what I mean? I don't know. Does so that make any sense? Yeah. So to what extent when you're playing, do you feel sensors out to audience, and to what extent do you not? I think it always, I mean, playing alone is one thing. You know, oftentimes I don't play alone. I have to play in groups and whatever, but uh, I think when, when, when I'm up here alone, I, I didn't feel a big change in terms of my responsibility or my, my, my role here with the light change, because I actually, I guess I didn't really catch what the light change is sort of symbolized. I just mm -hmm. felt a change. So in a way, um, you know, I, I, my reaction was maybe not as, or it didn't hit me as, as precisely as, as extreme, been. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that, and that's, that's so good. That, you know. Great. Okay, one more, yeah. Um, I, I just wanted, to follow up on the focus, and um, and I think um, Matthias was very focused on playing, and it's interesting that you only experienced very subtle shifts in your immediate surroundings. You didn't notice it went from spotlight right. to stage light to house light. You just know, noticed your instruments were slightly changing. And f for me too, like you, I was focused on your playing, not on the light. And so, yeah, I knew, I knew the kind of light was changing, but it was out of my focus. And so, um, so uh, the light did not focus me. Um, it was other things that were taking me to focus on one thing as opposed to the other. But someone in the back of the room may have a, a, different. a different focal point. 
Well, I think that there is also the spatial arrangement here and how that, how you will experience how distant the light is and how close you are to it is another piece of the, of the story. Okay, why don't we move on to exploration number two. Okay. Let us begin, and I'll introduce it in a moment. <laughs>
Carter and uh, Mat Matthias Binsley. So you guys know each other well? Some, not well. Not, not, not well. well, okay. Neither of them knew the other was going to be here until this evening. So um, thank you so much. We're delighted to have you. Um, so, yeah. Well. Okay, so now for this next one, this is your task, okay? Um, and um, we're gonna do it a few different ways. For, you need to play together for about a minute. You need to synchronize and start at precisely the same time and end at precisely the same time, okay? And you get to start and stop, but you can't talk to each other and you can't count off. You have to use anything other than talking in order to manage to synchronize and start and stop at the same time for just about a minute, not very long, okay? So let's do the first version now. Okay, so that was version one. Now we're going to do version two. So, um, uh, so it's going to be exactly the same task, but under rather different circumstances. Okay. You guys can't see. <laughs> um, actually, this. Well, we're going to we're going to set it up, and then you can tell us what you can see and what you can't. All right. Okay. So um, we have Elizabeth Parker and uh, Caitlin Waters from the. Uh, uh, interior design program. Thanks very much for helping. Okay, and we need. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the. Okay, so Matthias, what can you see? Uh, fabric. Okay. Two lovely ladies. <laughs> Okay, and Daniel, what can you say? I can see him right through there. You can see him right through there. Okay, very good. That's the setup. Here's the task. The same task again.
one last round. Same task. Bravo, well done. <laughs> That's great. So, um, so Matthias, tell us about how you solved the problem in those three different cases. And this will be your, your mic. Okay. It's almost like it got easier as we didn't see each other anymore, right? Does that make any sense? That was weird. It almost got easier as we, as we had more you know, obstacles. Um, you know, how is that? <laughs> I don't know. It just, there was no way he wasn't going to stop when I stopped. And I, kind of, I was kind of going to lead that. I don't know. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I was like, the drums are going to just stop it. <laughs> I don't know. Kind of arrogant. But the drums have control. So does he. But I felt like I'm just going to, I'm going to make it clear to him. I don't know. Pretty, pretty uh, self-absorbed, I guess. Um, the other ones, do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, when we could see each other, then we gestural cues and and I think it's probably just years of playing you get a sense of that and uh, even when we couldn't well I could see you you couldn't see me did we do the reverse of that no, we did one way okay, we did one way I thought so <laughs> skipped one you did <laughs> and so so we we became familiar with what's up, right, on a certain level where we don't have to think about it too much. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to go too far outside of uh, starting way different from each other or ending way different. Mm -hmm. So in those constraints, and I think that also, I mean, it doesn't always work out the best musically when there's a big uh, finale kind of thing, but I think we just busted into that intuitively and when you do that and you're playing with that kind of um, uh, stress and um, I mean in good sense stress but uh, and you know you more or less got to do that inside of a, a minute you know you got to do it like sort of like more hardcore punk style they do it quick because mm -hmm. sometimes they only had about 15 minutes on the stage and that's it so now it's even more hardcore so then you can feel the, the, um, how far you can go within that. And, and, uh, and we don't have like, we more or less went to the top. When you're, when you're at the top of the mountain, you can feel that. And like you said, you were gonna stop, right? So, so. so did we stop more or less? Uh, yeah, you were remarkably synchronized, <laughs> impressively so in each case, actually. Uh, and the third one, you, you cheated a bit by throwing a thing up so he could see it over the... Uh... He couldn't really see it land, though. <laughs> I couldn't really, he couldn't really see it land. Did you notice that? You didn't notice that at all? Because a lot of times I do have my eyes closed. Well, actually, I want to say one of the most impressive things is that you made it down those stairs with your oh, eyes that, closed, that which was, was that remarkable. That wasn't easy. So, that wasn't easy. No, I, I peaked because... <laughs> but I realized I had to sort of work with having to take steps and and try to have that help compose the music. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. OK, so what was your experience of the difference in the sight lines? Was it easier, harder, any different? I don't think it was harder, not seeing him. OK, so what, so, yeah. so ha, so what were the cues that you used for each other to start together? And, and how did you signal that it was time to come to a close? Well, I think you started a little, I was a little bit right after you, right? 
Yeah, I mean, he can yeah. see me walking up yeah. with the tambourine. It's not really rocket science. And the thing with the with this funny UFO-looking drum that I had on the lap, the second one, I mean, I was like, yeah, cheating, I guess. <laughs> but he can see me, and I know that. So why wouldn't I give? I mean, well, the of course, task that, that is, is to start together. Task, I'm right? not gonna, I'm not gonna like start small so he can't see it. Um, <laughs> uh, and the last one was just. I mean, I was more mocking, uh, you know, the obstacle rather than I didn't think he was actually going to see when this lands. Um, I think with with a big drum set, I mean, even if I start a split second before, he'll he'll be right on there. There's no there's no question. You know, I don't know. He could do the same to me. It would be just as effective. Uh, absolutely. The fact that I mean, I felt like what the you know you um, in improvisation you either. You can feel like you're in limbo, or you can feel like, okay, you gotta do something, or you know that somebody else is gonna do something. Uh, when you like, just hit it like that, um, then you're, you're right in there in a high energy thing. You can just sort of feel, uh, you know, like uh, once we busted into that, I say like, now I don't have to worry as much. You just feel where it's at. And um, Another thing is the one minute mark, that would, definitely change the whole situation, you know, or it changed, mm -hmm. or put a real parameter on it. Mm -hmm. And one, it's hard to know one minute sometimes. I don't necessarily know that we had one, I don't know if somebody checked, but if we were close to a minute or it was less or more, mm -hmm. I don't really know that. But um, it was definitely on my mind, I'd say half, to, half of that minute mm -hmm. I spent thinking, shit, wait, minute, the minute, you know. <laughs> we got to do, the, not, not stressed out about it, but like, oh, we, we should try to do this minute thing. That's the task, so let's try to, you know. Because we could have gone on or made it shorter or whatever, you know, it could have been anything really, but that thing also kept on knocking on my head, a little, like mm -hmm. on, my, on my, you know, back door a little bit. I don't know if you felt that. Right. I felt that. You know, I mean, if it's just going to be as free as we can be inside a minute, it's like Thoreau or something, you know, like, because I'd rather play like, five or six hours, you know, right. so we know, <laughs> and we got a sense from, uh, the, what did we do, two, three? Three of those, yeah. Three of them all together? Mm -hmm. Wow, once we did two, I felt like, wow, we knew what that was, we knew sort of what a minute yeah. was, <laughs> and like, um, you know how sometimes, like, if you, you go to sleep um, and you're not going to use an alarm clock, sometimes, you know, internally, you figure, you know. So I think all those kind of things, you know, uh, conspired to uh, us being able to do it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Any any comments from the audience about your experience? There's one right there. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, hi. I think it was really interesting to see all the performances we had. Like initially, when um, just started playing on the saxophone, then. <laughs> I don't know what the instrument is called. Saxophone. Yeah, saxophone. So um, I think initially um, you may have felt it's, it's a task for you to respond to it. And so you were trying uh, with your drums to respond to the saxophone. And then I think slowly, slowly, it's almost like you took a step back from the task and just started enjoying the music and started complimenting him instead of seeing it as you're on the spotlight and you need to perform and do something to react. And so that's what I thought. And um, I, I, um, I also felt that uh, your music got better when the obstacles uh, started coming in and when you couldn't see each other. And the second piece was so calming and uh, relaxing. And then the third one was so energetic. And I don't know if it's to do with if you take one sense away, your other senses get more empowered. As you said, that mostly you play with your eyes closed uh, when you play your drums. So maybe that was something to do with it. I think that's an interesting point. I don't know that really. I think, I mean, in, for myself, I'm, we know it from, you know, I mean, we, we, we see it that as a fact. I don't, I don't, I don't you know, when, you, when one sense gets taken away, others develop stronger. Obviously, that's... that's uh, that's a, that's a fact, but uh, uh, to the beginning part, it's interesting that you felt that way, that, oh, well, now he's, you know, he felt like I was sort of like, oh, wait, how do I get in there? I, I just, didn't, I was just happy he was there. <laughs> I, I didn't know he was there, and I was just really, really, I could have not played at all. I, I almost was tempted not to even come in, because it was just beautiful, you know, but um, I didn't feel um, 
Well, so maybe it goes what we, what we were saying. It wasn't more, it, it was more like, I'm gonna you know, try to compliment or you know, support him coming down these stairs. I was, really, I was really glad he was coming closer because I could hear better and, and you know. Um, so maybe it was less pressure. Maybe that's, is that what you kind of felt maybe? I don't know, yeah. But I, I was just really enjoying him coming, you know, him playing and, and, and just the fact that he's here. <laughs> I haven't seen him in years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, from the top of the stairs, you started playing pretty uh, soon after I started, right? I don't know, somewhere so. halfway down. So I, I, was, I didn't know if I had come in too quick, like you were supposed to do something else before I came. I didn't know if I was doing something wrong. No, none of that was uh, scripted. So. And, uh, and so uh, the challenge was just to get down the stairs without messing up notes too much. And, but I was re relieved the fact that, uh, that you know, I had a partner uh -huh. in this. And um, and it was like I had you know like there's always a thing like how you how you hook up what you feel what you feel as an individual with what somebody else is feeling as an individual, and then each of you more or less being able to uh, you know relate to what the other is doing or not be able to relate and. That, that always gets into a thing. Sometimes, I, uh, like I won't mention any names, but somebody was telling me that they were playing with this very, very um, uh, uh, celebrated, um, iconoclastic, uh, um, maybe I shouldn't say what the instrument is. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me that um, when he had a chance to play with this guy, he just made sure that he didn't listen to him because if he listened to what this guy was doing with the kind of impact that that guy has, it would throw him off. Now, of course, he, he heard something, but he was primarily just saying, I got to take care of my business because he knew that the, that the instrumentalist <laughs> was going to take care of his business. But here, I think it was more a thing of, you know, cross-fading into each other, you know, sound. And, and it didn't seem to take too long to have a sense, you know, like, where we both were at with, with respect to one another. Terrific. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm completely fascinated by mm. how barriers in space, whether they're physical mm -hmm. ones, affect the nature of interaction and dialogue, mm -hmm. or whether they're virtual and technological ones, right. right? I mean, when we're talking on the phone, we're not seeing a person on the other end. When we're texting, we have a different kind of delay. Right. There's a whole bunch of different features of interaction that we are all in big experiments right now, right? We are, being, we are using all these different channels and modes, and sometimes we see each other, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we are in the same physical space, not able to see each other, sometimes we can. Sometimes we're through a video screen and with a view of yourself at the same time, even weirder. weirder. There's all these odd manipulations happening right now, and I think it's a fascinating moment to be thinking about how dialogue and interaction happen in those moments, and, then, and how that changes in music compared to in talking, right? And music has its own dynamic, and for many musicians, closing your eyes while playing is what you do to really hear, right. in which case seeing isn't the point, right? While in other modes of interaction, sometimes seeing is the point. And for, and I have, so I've done some lab experiments comparing musicians playing together face-to-face -to -face versus via remote <laughs> video versus via remote audio. And the very clear finding is that when you're in an ongoing rhythm, it ha doesn't matter at all to the quality of your playing, whether you can see each other or not. If you're trying to come in out of nowhere with someone you've never played before and hit a note at the same time, you absolutely have to see each other. But whether you're via video or face-to-face -face doesn't matter at all. And if you look at the quality of the um, improvisations that a jazz saxophonist makes during that, made by blind raters, highest quality is in audio only, uh, worse in video, and least good face-to-face working exactly the other way around, we're seeing actually harms in that kind of music making. So I think it's a really interesting and fertile area of investigation. One thing, yeah. one thing I want to mention is that the thing on eyes closed or eyes open or eyes closed all the time or eyes, uh, eyes closed, eyes open, you know, whatever proportion. Um, musicians are different on that. Like some musicians keep their eyes open more of the time. I keep my eyes closed 
a lot of the time. And um, you know, some leaders of groups don't like that. You know, uh, I would imagine. Know, yeah. I was I was amazed at how, like, say Charlie Parker, he just like like that. You know, it's like, I don't know if maybe he has his eyes open. Maybe it's like when people, some people sleep with their eyes open, they don't see anything. I'm not sure <laughs> with Charlie Parker, but he's. I couldn't. I couldn't do that. It'd be too distracting for me. It also really depends on what music. I mean, this is not anything set. You know, right. We're just going, so it, it's it's in a way it's the easiest thing to do, or maybe the hardest for some of the people who like, who are toward, who like reading or who are trained to read mostly. And and, and uh, um, I've definitely played with people where I couldn't afford to have my eyes closed at all. As a matter of fact, I would have to stare at her, and that's as much as I say. I'm going to keep the name out to the whole entire 90 minutes every single night for two years just because the way she plays is very specific and if I don't catch every single move, and I'm talking physical move because I'm looking at her and there's a, there's a, there's a microphone on the, f on, the, on the floor too that I can maybe pick up some taps, whatever. If, if, if I could put, you know, if I could wire her brain and somehow wire it back to me, I would have done that. It's just, it's just, that's the way she was playing and I had to match that. That was, I was, my name wasn't on the ticket. You know, it wasn't on the thing, it was her name. And then for me to do that with close eyes, I would have gotten fired immediately. I would have been lost and, and, and gone off, off the gig f for sure. You know, so it really depends. This is very freedom based music, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and you know, and different musics are really, I mean, this is like everything else, you know, obviously music for us and for everybody maybe who's, who's close to music translates into everything else, uh, it's metaphorical for everything else, really, you know, he, you know, we're talking about, you know, communication and language and this and that. Uh, you know, I had a really, just, I'm gonna, real brief, um, I had a, about two weeks ago, I was in Macedonia playing with the Philharmonic, um, the Macedonian Philharmonics, and we were like four people, the non-classical guys, and I was playing a bunch of frame drums, smaller things, and, and it was time for a, a, a solo for me in one piece. It was like a full evening, you know, uh, concert. And, and I had a little open solo. It was discussed what that meant, open, meant open, that I would play as long as I f wanted to and, and or felt was right. A and I would stop in tempo and I would look at the conductor and he would take it from there. He would, he would bring the orchestra back in. This is 70 people or something. And he either really didn't understand, which I kind of don't, by or he was just he flipped out. There's a video online I, I, I didn't see because I had my eyes closed. I didn't see him flipping out at me literally in front of a full house, 900 and something people watching this and he was making gestures like, <laughs> like this, literally like, what an idiot. I mean, I'm, he was an amazing conductor in one way, but what an idiot to give it away in front of 900 people to be like, you know, what kind of communication was that? Like, and, and just shows again how the differences in, 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 like this situation, Daniel would have never made gestures, ever. I would have never made gestures at Daniel. It was, it's, it's, the, it's the circumstances, obviously, that, that, um, that allowed us to do this with a lot of ease, without much of, of effort, right? And, and, and just the different worlds can collide like that, and, and you know, it's just, it was a really funny, I mean, he, I don't want to, you know, he's amazing at what he does. I, I don't know what he does half the time, and, and I can't follow him, but he could not, jump into that world and be comfortable. It was really interesting to see him like giving it up in front of like the whole house. <laughs> it was crazy. I didn't see, but I saw a video later. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah there's, there's more bridges to be built between these different genres yeah. and ways of working. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on to exploration number three. Okay. Four. All right, so this time your task, and this is the final one, okay? So this time your task is to play with each other as you see fit and some things will change. Okay, and then I will signal you when it's time to bring it to a close, okay? <laughs>
Okay, great, thank you very much, that's terrific. Um, so, obviously what happened during that time is some of you came down here and were on the stage. Um, now, to what extent did you two notice that at all? You seemed quite into what you were doing with each other. I'm pretty sure I noticed it after. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I actually watched Daniel notice it, that was pretty funny. <laughs> I, I saw your first reaction when they were right there. 
I saw them coming down because this time around I figured I'm going to try something new and keep my eyes open. Uh, I, you, you, you noticed me noticing them? Yeah, yeah. Wow, I thought it was real subtle. Me. Yeah, it was like a hawk on you. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, now, did you feel affected by it? Yeah, in the very beginning, some, but then they kept on coming. I was like, oh, this is what's happening. And, <laughs> and I was even thinking maybe you would t tell them to actually grab some stuff or like interact, <laughs> like really interfere or something. That would have <laughs> been my next expectation in some, you know, in some way. So I don't know, I, you know, I, the first couple of ones, and then, okay, that's what's happening. It didn't bother me at all. I don't know. Didn't really so I'm throw sure me off. I don't yeah, I mean, I, in a way, I mean, I feel like the proximity and also when you're talking about demarcation between up there and down here, it's like we have more energy with us on the stage. For a second, I thought, oh, I'm playing on the subway platform <laughs> or something. <laughs> All these people around me are like... Yeah, so I'm, so I'm curious about the experience for the people who came on stage. How different is it to be here? And how, is, how, how different was your experience of the music than it was up there? And how different um, was your, did you notice those folks looking at you? So there's a mic over there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I note, well, it was quite a transgression. Mm -hmm. for me to come here because I, I felt there was this amazing thing happening and I felt that I was like no you know like no why why is this guy sitting on the stage and then that created an energy in me that was quite distracting and actually the first things though I felt was that I sat down a bit here and then I realized everybody else had sat down to the back so I was a bit front and I really wanted to be even closer. I wanted to, I'm gonna do it. I wanted to kind of sit here, but I totally didn't dare to do it. And then I felt the only way to control this conflict or the address this conflict in me that was I have just inserted my presence into something quite awesome, was to actually close my eyes and try to find the music. And if I could find the music, and those were like waves, I would totally forget myself. And I would just kind of like be rocked and then there would be this thing. And then something happened, a foot moves and I wake up again and it's like whoosh. And then I had to close my eyes again. And So you had a little stage fright. <laughs> no, it's, I think, you know, I'm actually uh, teaching acting. Um, actually, I think it's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think if we accept what we feel, there's incredible energy. I mean, so many people looking at a dude, just even the vicinity, like, it's like, what the hell? And so that energy kind of belongs to the music, and you know, my medium was being a guy sitting on stage, so. Great, thank you. So you spoke about the, uh, well, actually, let's move over here, but I, I want to talk to the person who uh, was willing to walk right up and look, okay? But, oh, you have one, oh, great, okay. Can you turn that mic up? Again? Hi. Yeah. I only felt like uh, a person on the stage when I actually walked onto the stage and knew that there was a tension on me during that moment. And I only became aware of everyone in the other audience at the very end. Most of the time, I had this experience of being backstage. There's a certain front that you portray. We see your head, we see your hands, we see the front of your kit, and that's it. And back here, I see all these instruments, and they're all laid out, and I spent so much time reflecting on how you have a very specific relationship, a very specific musical and intentional relationship with every object that I can now see, and how you make choices about that I think my, being backstage, my feeling of being backstage, I'm getting in your head, and I'm literally behind you, and I metaphorically behind you. I felt that I, all of a sudden had no more room in there. Say that again? I felt that all of a sudden had no more room in there. <laughs> uh, with the connection with every single object, that's definitely true. We don't want to get too crazy about, or too much into detail about that, but that's, that's kind of a, yeah, that's definitely true. Everything has a story, you know? And um, yeah, that's definitely fun. Sometimes you sit down on somebody else's setup, and maybe a similar kind of a guy like or a girl like has a lot of stuff rather than just a regular, regular drum set. And 
and you're oh wow you're basically in a foreign land or you know so it's it's, it's definitely that's definitely something but uh, um, I think I mean for for it really depends if if, you, if you're used to being on stage or not I mean some people are just on stage a lot and they don't really care I don't really I care maybe some like I'm sure it affects me some but I don't really I've played in really small places and really big places and and sometimes small places could be definitely more intimidating you know put, put, Potentially, if if the maybe, maybe if you feel uncomfortable with the music, and, you know, and a big place doesn't necessarily have to just because it's eighty thousand people on a big lawn doesn't necessarily mean you're you're eighty thousand times more scared to play. I don't know. It's a strange thing, but uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so tell us about your journey. Movement is so important, and I got the sense from the 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 latecomers uh, entrance and the immediacy with which you responded to that, um, that was so exciting. And then, you know, we waited a bit during that um, exploration for more responsiveness. And in fact, I didn't experience you as responding to the light, and I, this was, you know, before, and I really wondered if, if and how it would be different had you been. Um, and so when everybody started to walk down this time and there was an immediate response and it was so interesting and so exciting, I, before I even had the thought to move myself, I wanted everybody to keep filing around and to interact because that is the, the interesting thing about collaboration is that there needs to be, I guess, a consistent uh, contribution. And, and I guess when I came down, I just, I wanted to dance or I wanted to, you know, you know, speculate and see and maybe it's a fantasy of omnipotence kind of a thing but would it change if my movement changed and how and I just and I you know I have been in some um, improvisational movement um, workshops so I'd be playing with you know, as a trumpet player walking around while we're all rolling on the floor and I think that there's just this you know it's just such excitement about that give and take and, and wanting everybody to, to be a part of that. So, and then I got, and I said, okay, don't get back up. <laughs> but I wanted to, and, and I think that that's that same impulse that you had where you want to be involved, you know? Excited. Okay, I want to hear from folks out there. How did it change your experience for there to be some of you filing out and others not? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for this wonderful evening, and uh, it's a lot of fun and also a privilege to be here. What the last speaker said is something which was on my tongue all the time. At, after the first exploration, the discussion centered around the issue that a dialogue would go on. I, I didn't actually realize that dialogue. My observation was, in fact, the opposite that uh, Matthias hardly reacted to the music and was concerned with himself. And when the light was full house, uh, yeah, we were still listeners. And now the, the third one made the point clear for me. And I, I wonder whether this was part of, the, of, of, of your choreography, Michael, <laughs> or whether these were the free reactions of those who walked uh, on the stage, because if music has a lot to do with rhythm and dance has a lot with rhythm, listening to music means dancing or at least moving rhythmically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to speak, historically, it took a couple of hundred years to discipline our bodies in such a weird way that when we hear music, we sit. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an enormous cultural work and, and, and not really a nice work. And, and so s some of you, you had this feeling you may dance, in other words, actually allow the music to uh, reach you, but you didn't. And yeah. so for me, this three exploration demonstrated this enormous cultural achievement that we cannot listen to music because we, we don't allow the music to enter us. And, but maybe this was not your intention. <laughs> no, I, I was actually, there was no instruction as to whether the folks who come on stage stand or sit. That was entirely up to them. Um, and it could be that once the first few people sat, everybody else, you know, now a convention has been set, we're all going to sit. But it could just as easily have been that the first people chose to stand mm -hmm. and then there would have been something else. Although whether they would have felt comfortable moving in front of 
while being watched, you know, without everyone moving, that might have been complicated. So what we did, we did a weird, complicated thing, right? We sort of separated out the audience into two, some of whom are part of this sort of collective thing going on up here and part of whom are not. And that is an, an odd manipulation again, right? Of there, we could have said everybody must come on stage and then we're all in a communal space together, uh, which would have been a different manipulation. But again, this, the way the space is set up here um, only affords certain kinds of interactions, and there actually probably, well, there probably would be room for everybody here on the stage, maybe, <laughs> but maybe not everybody would want to come either, so wanted, I did want to choreograph it to make it certain people are coming and others not, and that opens up one kind of discussion. But I think, I think your point about uh, uh, listening to music and not uh, uh, moving being a relatively recent phenomenon, and only for some kinds of music mm -hmm even, but we are in a, in a hall that is uh, set up for exactly that, right? This is not set up so that everybody in the seats can be dancing and moving. We would be in the club or a place where people, uh, you know, I mean, lots of different spaces end up telling you how to be. And this space gives a very strong set of signals about how to be, and this was an attempt to disrupt that a little. Okay. You know, I, w I was just saying, like, when I, when I, um, for, when I started to, realized more people were gonna come up and I see the movement, uh, immediately I was really relating that movement to dance and then seeing that it wasn't gonna really blossom into that, you know, I was like <laughs> disappointed, you know. Um, and um, as far as like clubs, see, as far as I know, like different places, because I don't get out much anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> But um, I, I would figure there wouldn't be uh, music much like this. Not at all to, you know, there's a whole critique of what is played. And a lot of it I love, but I feel like it is constricted. Limited. Not necessarily the fault of the artists, you know. But so I think there is a big uh, chasm that, um, Really, it would be really great if it were filled, you know, um, with with um, chances to do, Im you know, spontaneous music or improvised music, or let's just say like a lot of music that you won't find in clubs. They, they don't. They, they, there's a whole lot of music they don't have in clubs, but yet th those are the places where you can go and dance. Right. Right. And Repeating this is definitely myself. not a dance space. It's not set up to be one. Yeah. Right. Anybody else in the in, up in that part of the audience? But this could be. Wait a minute. <laughs> this is a really <laughs> nice floor here. I mean, <laughs> you know. Well, no, I, no. My intention, actually, and we are coming close to closing at this point. Okay. Um, my intention was that um, the last part will be you all doing one last bit, and everyone up there is welcome to come down here because this is where the reception afterwards is going to be. So, and that could afford dancing if people want. Okay, so uh, that is how we are going to end Excuse this. Uh, uh, and everyone, everyone is welcome to come down, and there will be a reception. Um, oh, there was. Can I ask you? You know, yeah. just one thing that I thought was really interesting about breaking the fourth wall. Mm -hmm. You know that you, it is totally set up to be performers and spectators. And, and when we passed f breaking that wall, you know, like a transgression, transgression almost, you, you're part of it. And you're sort of, you break it and it's like you're watching and now you're sort of part of it. And it's really, it's cool. And there's something that says, don't do that. You're an audience member, you know. And there's another part, you know, when you're backstage, you get that VIP pass or that backstage pass. And you kind of feel like special in a certain way. You know someone who knows a member of the band. And when I was back here, I was sitting and I, it felt like that feeling that I have. And you kind of feel extra special in a certain way because you're like behind the scenes and we're seeing you know, all your stuff. And um, it's re it's just, it just feels really good in a way. To, and it felt good to break the barrier, you know, to like come on stage and you're sort of breaking the rule a little bit, but it feels good when you're on this side. So it was fun.
So I, I'm personally a huge fan of proximity in music making, and I think there's so many times now that stages are set up so that the musicians are really far away and the audience is all separated. And you know, there's something, I mean, I really love chamber music, you know, music in small spaces where, that was designed for those small spaces where the, the, the listeners are three feet from the players and are right there in the middle of it. And I think that's just a fantastic thing. And what we've done here is a little bit of bringing that to the table, right? And saying, here's how we communally are all part of the music making by reducing the distance. You know, there's, this, there's this place up on, in, in Harlem, uh, the Red Rooster, on Monday nights. And they have a jazz band and they have hip hop singers. And it's a circular bar. And so the musicians move around the bar. And you don't know, I mean, literally, you can be dancing and the, the singer is right, you, you know, right there next to you. And the trumpet player is across the bar and every, it's all wireless mics and it, it's just all sort of, it's, it's much more communal and dancing and fun and just a community of, of musicians and dancers and people. It's great. Cool. One, one more comment. Yeah. Um, hello. I would like to say context always matters. And we're all improvising here because I guess even you guys didn't know what you were going to play. So we don't know which are the rules today. Technically, we go to any space, to the supermarket or to the subway. We know which are the rules, so we perform according to the rules. But today, there are no rules. So just being behind, for example, distracted me, because since I don't know which is the music, uh, just seeing the audience doesn't allow me to try to understand what they're playing. So um, I think that the, the basic role here is that the rules are not existent. So that's what makes us all wonder which, what's happening in the next minute for them, for us, and for everybody. That's about it. Yeah, we, I certainly, we certainly set up an evening of some uncertainty, right? And that was on purpose. Uh, and, um, and it really was, it was part of discussions with John Sarr and Elizabeth and others about um, kicking off this symposium, that part of what we're hoping for the symposium is to spark and provoke thought about space and imagination and what pushes you into a new place. And so tonight was an attempt to do a few pushes. Right. So um, I want to thank everyone. I want to really thank uh, Matthias and Daniel, fantastic performers. We're so lucky to have them. And, and thank you for being so game to you know go with what go with what happens. And thank you to all of the participants in the dialogue. Uh, really, your being here is a huge piece of what this is. So it's it's really terrific to have you here. And uh, and I really want to wish everybody a great symposium uh, tomorrow and this and this evening and tomorrow. Uh, so uh, as the last part, if uh, you two would be willing to play one last time, and everyone is welcome to come on down and uh, join this communal area. Uh, and this is where the reception after this will be. So thanks so much.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 